Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about the big lossless scaling update. The frame generator has been enhanced, increasing precision and promising to fix most ghosting issues. At its current state, I can confidently say that lossless scaling is a superior option compared to FSR3 mods, which I've covered in previous dedicated videos. Let's clarify why lossless scaling is better than the FSR3 mod. First, the issue of monetization. To get lossless scaling, you pay a small fee on Steam, around $7, or 17 reis in Brazil. If you find it expensive, there are often promotions with discounts ranging from 30% to 40%. On the other hand, to use the FSR 3.0 mod, you'll likely have to pay a monthly subscription on the creator's Patreon for updates. Moreover, lossless scaling doesn't cause bans in online games. You can play Valorant CS Silverwatch without worries because it doesn't inject anything into the game's code, unlike the FSR 3 mod. It also doesn't trigger crashes at specific points in the game. I've heard reports that the unofficial FSR 3.0 mod can cause random crashes, like in The Last of Us. To be clear, I'm not receiving anything to recommend this application. I'm recommending it because I know it can help a lot for those with more modest hardware. But it's important to note that your PC needs to be able to maintain a game at 30 FPS for lossless scaling to work decently. That said, let's talk about the updates that came with LSFG2. Recently, there has been a significant improvement in the architecture for processing large-scale movements. This allows for the use of a lower input frame rate. However, it's still recommended that your game be running with lossless scaling disabled, with a minimum of 30 to 40 FPS, which is ideal for 1080p and 1440p resolutions, respectively. For an enhanced visual experience, it's advisable that the input FPS be at least 60. Reduction of Artifacts and GPU Performance There has been a noticeable reduction in common artifacts such as motion ghosting, edge distortion, and image blur caused by the frame interpolator. If many artifacts are still visible, it's advisable to increase the input frame rate. GPU usage has increased between 1.5 and 2 times, depending on the resolution. To compensate for this, a new performance mode has been added in the settings. By enabling it, you'll have the same performance as previous versions, with some improvements. Therefore, if you have more modest hardware, opting for performance mode will result in superior performance compared to the previous version, LSFG 1.1. And as always, I'll conduct some tests, both on emulators and native PC games, to see how we fare using this new version. The first game tested was Cyberpunk 2077. The game settings are all at maximum, with ray tracing enabled, without any type of upscaling, and without enabling the game's native frame generator. Only with Nvidia Reflex enabled, as frame rate interpolation programs are known to increase input delay. First, we'll have a comparison using the game's own benchmark tool in split screen so you can notice that no artifacts are displayed. All ray tracing effects are also rendered correctly without many issues. During recording, I'm using a 180 Hz monitor and I can clearly state that the game captured with lossless scaling active looks a bit smoother. However, as you can see, my frame rate using lossless scaling reached over 150 FPS output, while the game's input FPS dropped from about 45 FPS to 30 FPS. This is because lossless scaling utilizes some of the GPU processing to generate its frames, resulting in a lower input FPS when using the program. Speaking of the generated frames, I honestly don't believe they have the same smoothness as native 150 FPS, not even 100 FPS. It seems like the generated smoothness is around 60 to 80 FPS during this test. Remembering that I would have better results if my input FPS were higher, but I chose to run the game with everything at maximum. I also tested gameplay in the city, including in faster environments, such as in high-speed cars, and neither the HUD nor other elements, like the minimap, present major visual issues. Once again, the game doesn't seem to have the smoothness of 150 FPS. Instead, it seems to be between 45 and 60 FPS, which is still a significant improvement. However, when moving the weapon very fast, it's noticeable that the crosshair shows small artifacts. In scenes of frenetic action, I had no difficulty hitting distant enemies, even using different types of weapons. My combat smoothness seemed to be above 60 FPS. Therefore, overall, with my tests in Cyberpunk, the user should evaluate whether they prefer to deal with small graphical problems or have almost doubled the frames generated by the lossless scaling algorithm. I conducted an input delay test, as mentioned earlier. In this specific case, I'm using NVIDIA Reflex, which promises to reduce latency. The result we obtained is shown in the background, 
and in my opinion, the delay was not noticeable using lossless scaling plus NVIDIA Reflex. Before we move on to the tests on emulators, I'd like to ask you to leave your like to ensure even more content with various tests like this one. If this is your first time here, consider subscribing to receive new content every week. Our second test was using the PlayStation 3 emulator, RPCS3. In this test, we used the 1080p resolution with the two heaviest games from this system, God of War 3 and Metal Gear Solid 4. Let's see how our results were. In God of War 3, the game was running at only 30 FPS. However, lossless scaling managed to elevate it to about 120 FPS. The smoothness of the game seems to be close to 100 FPS, but when compiling new shaders, it's noticeable that there are drops, even with the program enabled. Therefore, if you can't maintain the game minimally acceptable, LLS won't work miracles, but it helps a lot in gameplay. Still on RPCS3, I tested Metal Gear Solid 4. While RPCS3 can deliver between 30 and 50 FPS, LLS shows a rate of almost 150 FPS. However, even though RPCS3 didn't show visual artifacts or other graphical problems, the smoothness doesn't seem close to 60 FPS. In many moments, especially in this game, it's noticeable that the FPS is below the acceptable, and it doesn't seem worth using LLS in Metal Gear, as with the program disabled, I would have at least about 10 to 15 FPS more. Before finishing with RPCS3, I conducted an input delay test, and the result is practically the same as when using Cyberpunk with NVIDIA Reflex. Even using the controller wirelessly with the original Microsoft dongle, there is no noticeable input delay. I also tested Xenia, the Xbox 360 emulator, specifically with the game Forza Horizon. Last time I tested this game, it had many artifacts in the HUD. Since LLS recommends that the program works with FPS above 40, I conducted tests with unlocked and locked FPS at 30 FPS to see if the result really differs. As you can see, with 30 FPS input, LLS can make the game run at 120 FPS, generating about 3 frames for every one the emulator renders. However, the result with 30 FPS input is not so satisfactory. Although there are no graphical problems in the HUD, the smoothness still leaves much to be desired. When looking at the grass beside the track, it's clear that the gameplay is at 30 FPS. On the other hand, with unlocked FPS, where the emulator was delivering between 60 and 90 FPS, the smoothness really seems to indicate that the game is running above 100 FPS. For a clear comparison and to check if we found graphical artifacts, common in racing games when using AI frame generation, I'll leave a segment of the game running at 30 FPS. As you can see, there are no artifacts in the minimap, odometer, or user interface, proving a gameplay without artifacts, even in a fast-paced game with only 30 FPS input. As for input delay, we have a serious problem. I don't know if this is a chronic problem of Xenia or LLS, but when we see the input delay, it seems horrible. During tests with Forza Horizon, I didn't notice this delay so bad in this way. I conducted a test with Sadachi, the successor of Yuzu, in the game Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. LLS delivered about double the FPS, but there were many stutters and the smoothness was not close to 60 FPS. Unfortunately, there were issues with the recording and it corrupted the entire file. I also did input delay tests using Sadachi, and as you can see, there was a bit of delay, something that can bother more demanding players. In conclusion, LLS can be a great help for less demanding players or those with more modest hardware, who don't have resources to invest in new equipment. However, for more demanding players, it may not be the ideal solution. In these cases, improving hardware performance is the best option. For those who choose to use LLS, it's important not to focus solely on the output FPS shown. Often, even with an FPS above 100, the game's smoothness can feel well below 50. It's important to remember that keeping this new LLS algorithm running can cost even about 10 to 15 FPS on an RTX 4070. Therefore, in cases like mine, I prefer to use these FPS to keep my game more stable than using LSS and have an AI-generated frame rate. Additionally, if your game has a native frame generator, it's recommended to use it instead of LLS. Native frame generators are already programmed exactly for which objects should accelerate, and which should not, such as user interfaces, for example. So, this was the video folks, thanks for watching, and until next time.